Okay, so in this uh, video, I'm going to talk about three very important theorem about well-rising equilibrium. Uh, the first one is called uh, First Fundamental Theorem of uh, Welfare Economics. The second one is the existence of uh, well-rising equilibrium. And then the third one is called the Second Fundamental Theorem of Welfare Economics. So let's start with the first one. Um, its statement is actually very basic uh, and it requires a very mild assumption. So here it goes. If each a consumer's utility function, UI, is strictly increasing, well, then every Walrasian equilibrium allocation is Pareto efficient. So here, uh, strictly increasing utility function for every consumer is key. Uh, however, it's a mild assumption in the sense that almost all the examples we work in this course uh, are having increasing utility function and strictly increasing utility function, uh, which by the way basically says the more agents consume, the higher utility they should be getting. So if this assumption is true, then the Walrasian equilibrium allocation is pretty efficient, uh, meaning if we just let these agents trade with each other as freely as they like, uh, nobody needs to intervene to this market because eventually they're going to reach to an Walrasian equilibrium outcome, which is pretty efficient. And so there's going to be no inefficiency. Let them trade. Obviously, in real life, in the markets, there are a bunch of other inefficiencies, not, but because, not because of the uh, utility functions are not, not, not increasing, but you know, there's informational asymmetry and a and, and bunch of other complications. So, in a simple world, uh, we do have uh, this very nice property. Well, the question is, before jumping to the second fundamental theorem of welfare economics, uh, the question is, obviously, uh, I mean, are we sure that every economy has a Walrasian equilibrium? I mean, maybe in some economies there isn't any Walrasian equilibrium outcome. Uh, so, the existence. So, when can we sure that a Walrasian equilibrium outcome exists? This is a very important theorem, especially if you're solving a numerical example. You may actually end up a, a, an outcome, a solution where you can't come up with a price, while well, rather an equilibrium price, where the markets are clear. Um, so you may wonder, am I doing something wrong mathematically, algebraically, or is this because there is no well resin equilibrium in this market? Well, it may be the, 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 not the former, but the latter, all right? So the well resin equilibrium outcome may not even exist. Well, for this, we need assumptions. So if every utility, fund, not every utility, every consumer has a continuous utility function, increasing, strictly increasing utility function, and that's not enough concave uh, utility, strictly concave utility function, all right? And then each individual has an endowment, which is strictly positive, meaning for every good that is available in this market, each agent has a positive uh, endowment. Uh, well, then, by the way, I'm giving this theorem for the case uh, of no production. When we have production, we have to make further assumptions about the technology of the firms or the production possibility set. So I'm going to ignore that because those assumptions are a slightly bit complicated and requires additional assumption, uh, notations. So I'm going to skip that. Uh, but just for um, uh, economies where there's no production or assuming that the firm's uh, production functions are nice, quote unquote, nice behaving, so if the utility functions are continuous increasing and concave, well, then you know what? And if the initial endowments are positive, well, then we will certainly have a Walrasian equilibrium outcome. Otherwise, if one of those assumptions fail to hold, and in fact, I am planning to talk about some examples where initial endowments are zero, uh, although uh, preferences are continuous, utilities are continuous increasing and concave, we may fail to reach uh, a well rising equilibrium outcome, or we may have, for example, non concave uh, utility function, and even though the other assumptions hold, we may not get a well rising equilibrium outcome. So, those examples are coming up. 
Now, the, so we, 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 we know that uh, a Walrasian equilibrium uh, outcome may exist under certain assumptions. Well, the second fundamental theorem of welfare economics is basically about what we discussed in the first welfare theorem. In the first welfare theorem, remember, if uh, utility functions are continuous, fine, well then any Walrasian equilibrium is proto-efficient. There's no inefficiency. But can I say any proto-efficient allocation is uh, a Walrasian equilibrium outcome for some price uh, ratio? Can I say something like this? Uh, well, in a sense, uh, this is the, uh, the, the second welfare theorem uh, of welfare economics uh, uh, says this can be true. This, the, the inverse of this statement or the converse of this state, uh, converse, the inverse of this statement can be true under a, a stronger set of assumptions. So suppose that each consumer has, oh, by the way, again, I'm giving uh, the second fundamental theorem of welfare economics for economies without production, because if we have production, we need further assumptions about the production possibility sets or the production functions or technologies. So let's leave production aside. So suppose that each consumer has strictly increasing concave and continuous utility function. And every consumer has strictly positive endowments, WI, for every good. Well, if the initial endowments, WI, uh, if the initial endowments are proto-efficient, so this is an allocation, right? If it is proto-efficient, well, then there exists some price vector, P, such that P and W, P is the price vector, price of good one, good two, good three, etc. And W is the uh, initial endowment for each consumer, for each good. So this, uh, 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 you know, allocation and, and, and uh, um, price and uh, uh, an initial endowment is a Walrasian equilibrium of this exchange economy. All right. So if the endowments are uh, pretty efficient. Well, yes, we can actually find some price ratio so that, or the price vector, so that this initial endowment is a Walrasian equilibrium of this economy, uh, if all these assumptions hold, which is important again in order to guarantee that Walrasian equilibrium does exist. All right, um, so that's it. Okay, so I have now two examples um, and in, in both of these examples the assumptions uh, that I <clears throat> underlined for the existence of Walrasian equilibrium uh, I mean at least one of the assumptions uh, fail to hold fails to hold so here in the first example uh, the utility functions are increasing the utility functions are continuous but they're not concave. I mean, the utility function of the agent B is in fact uh, uh, convex. All right, uh, the endowments are, 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 are strictly positive, but uh, we, we fail, the assumptions of concavity fails to hold. In the second end, I'm gonna show that there is no uh, Walrasian equilibrium in this example. Okay, here uh, we have again increasing utility functions, strictly increasing. Oh, I'm sorry. It is not strictly increasing, all right? So here, the agent A's utility function increases with X, but it's the, uh, it doesn't increase with Y, all right? Uh, so the, uh, the agent B's utility function, however, is increasing um, and concave. However, these are also not really strictly concave. Um, nevertheless, here, the key thing uh, that is going to uh, fail the existence of Walras in equilibrium is that the initial endowments are not strictly positive. So agent A has zero endowment for the second good, agent B has the zero endowment for the first good. Well, in our previous example, the initial endowments were not strictly positive, but we had a Walras in equilibrium. Well, yes, that was by chance, all right? So don't forget, when I say, if the assumptions like concavity strictly increasing, uh, utility functions and uh, uh, concave strictly increasing, what else? Uh, continuous and then positive endowments. Well, then we definitely, we sure have, uh, we surely have a Walrasian equilibrium. If 
any one of those assumptions fail, we may or may not have a Walrasian equilibrium. All right. So these are two examples where we don't have a Walrasian equilibrium. So let's show this. I mean, uh, these are also good exercises to check uh, how we calculate the Walrasian uh, equilibrium. Well, there's no production, by the way, in both of those examples. Well, how do I start? Well, simple. Remember the Consumer's problem is maximize utility subject to budget constraint, which is XPX YPY equals the income, which is basically uh, one and one for each good. So I'm going to write PX plus PY, therefore. Okay. Well, so here, these are not differentiable utility functions. So margin rate of substitution equals price ratio. Negative price ratio is not going to help me. But what I know is because this is... Uh, at the min function, remember our uh, utility maximization lecture videos. So if you don't remember, please go back to those videos and, 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 and re re sort of refresh your mind how we calculate the optimal demands uh, for those utility functions. So whenever you have a minimum of two things, well, the optimal allocation will always satisfy the first term equal the second term. Uh, so therefore, agent A is going to consume equal amount of good X and good Y. All right. So once I plug this to his uh, budget constraint, that basically means 2X APX, right? YPY is going to be, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's my uh, mistake. So this is XPX plus Y is equal to XPY. So in XA parenthesis, I must have PX plus PY equals px plus py so therefore xa is equal to one and because ya is equal to xa it is also equal to one so the consumer a is actually uh, does not want to trade any good all right well what about agent b same problem maximize utility subject to budget constraint uh, because uh, he also has the same initial endowments his income is also the same uh, well, here, however, when you have a max uh, utility function, remember, um, for good X, for good Y, I'm drawing indifference curves. The indifference curves, like min XY, are always going to move along the 45 degree line. They're going to have kink points there. And as they move in this direction, it means higher indifference curve. When it is, however, max of XY, well, this time those curves will flip, okay? Meaning when I have max XY, again, those indifference curves are gonna move along 45 degree line, but the indifference curve are going to move in this fashion. And so as we move to the northeast direction, it, it, it means higher indifference curve, but it is convex, uh, convex uh, for that reason. So when we have an optimal, uh, I'm sorry, when we have a, a, a budget constraint, well, the optimal is not going to be the king point. Because, for example, if this is my budget line, uh, this king point is no longer optimal because uh, higher indifference curves can be attained by consuming uh, the boundaries. Well, if the graph is confusing you, forget about it. Look at the utility function. It's a maximum of X and Y. It basically tells me just consume on one good. Uh, consuming the other good is not going to bring you any utility as long as you consume X more than Y. So spend your entire money on just one specific good. Well, obviously, if the price of good X and good Y are different than one, you will invest, I'm sorry, not invest, you will consume uh, only the cheaper good. If PX is less than PY, you're going to spend your entire income on good X. Okay? So, um, therefore, the demand is a bit tricky here. Uh, XB equals zero and YB equals your entire income, which is PX plus PY divided by you know, this is the price of good, uh, good Y. Uh, if, however, PX is uh, greater than PY. So good Y is cheaper. So in that case, this should be the optimal demand. However, oops, XB, you're going to spend your entire income. I mean, rev, mm, 
uh, revenue that you can generate by selling your endowment on good X and consumes, oops, zero good Y if price of good Y is higher than price of good X. If they're equal, well, both of them, either one of these two are equilibrium, all right? So if you like, you can put uh, greater than or equal to. So if, if PX and PY are equal, this one is equilibrium uh, optimal, this one is also optimal, all right? When I say either one of them, I mean both of them are optimal. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, that means the following. So here I want to, uh, so I found the demands, optimal demands, right? So the optimal demands, let's uh, generate the uh, market demand. Market demand for good X and then market demand for good Y. Well, for, remember, the market demand for good X depends on the price ratio because consumer B's uh, uh, demand depends on the price ratio. So for that reason, I'm going to have a market demand for good X if PX is greater than or equal to PY um, and otherwise. Okay, same here. If PX is greater than or equal to PY and otherwise. So if PX is greater than or equal to PY, the demand for good X for agent B is zero. Agent A, however, is always one. So the total demand for good X is one. Otherwise, I mean, if the price of good Y is higher than PX, well, the, 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 the agent, uh, 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 agent one still, agent A, I'm sorry, still demands one, all right? Uh, agent B, however, demands this much, PX plus PY divided by PX. Now, the market demand for good Y, similar reasoning. If the price of good X is higher than price of good Y, uh, well, uh, remember, uh, A always wants to demand one. The question is, what's the demand for agent B? Agent B's demand here, in this case, is gonna be PX plus PY over PY, and here it's going to be zero, all right? So these are the market demands. All right, now the final step the market clearing conditions. I mean, the market demand for good X must be equal to market supply for good X. And at the same time, market demand for good Y must be equal to market supply for good Y. Market supply for good X is one plus one, two, because each agent has one unit of good X. Same for good Y. So therefore, uh, market clearing, clearing, uh, for good X. Well, here you go. Uh, demand is one and the supply is two. If PX is greater than or equal to PY, right? I mean, don't forget the demand is one only if this is the price. Uh, well, clearly one is not equal to two. So therefore, if we have a Walrasian equilibrium price should not be greater than, price of good X should not be greater than price of good Y. All right, otherwise, uh, we have a demand one uh, plus PX plus PY over PX and has to be equal to two. All right, so let's work with this. Uh, what does that mean? That means uh, PX plus PY over PX equals one. I just send this one to the other side. I do the cross product, PX plus PY equals PX. Uh, well, PXs will cancel out, PY is equal to zero. Okay, look, if PY is zero, okay, what's gonna happen? Uh, well, yes, PY is zero and PX. Uh, well, remember PX has to be, I mean, if PX is greater than PY, the market doesn't clear. So the PX must be less than or equal to PY. Prices can never be negative. I mean, forget about negative prices, okay? So therefore, PX should also be zero. So zero price good X, zero price for good Y. In this case, the market demand is going to be, uh, I'm sorry, the market for good X is going to be clear, uh, not really. If PX is zero, if PY is zero, well then this is infinite. I mean, uh, consumer B is going to demand infinite amount, very large, I mean, infinite amount of good X. 
And so therefore, market will not clear. All right, so again, PY equals zero implies PX is also zero because uh, remember, we are in the otherwise condition, meaning PX has to be less than or equal to PY. And so if PY is zero, PX must also be zero, it can't be negative. But if PX is zero, well, then the demand for good X is going to be infinite not for consumer A, he's going to demand one only, but for uh, consumer B. So as a result of this, the demand, I'm sorry, the market for good X will never clear. Well, uh, should I look at market for good Y and its clearance? No, because remember what Rosin Equilibrium says, uh, there must exist a price ratio PXPY or a price vector PXPY in so that uh, both uh, market for good X and good Y uh, will clear. However, we can't find a price where market for, uh, market for good X will clear. Hence, no uh, Walrasian equilibrium, Walrasian equilibrium, uh, if these are the utility functions. All right? Now, very quickly, uh, look at the second example where we don't have strictly positive uh, initial endowments. Uh, well, what is the optimal demand for agent A and B? Once again, we have the maximized utility subject to budget constraint. Here, it is XPX plus YPY. So I'm talking about agent A. So his endowment is 10 and 0. So it's 10 times PX plus zero times PY, so I ignore that. Well, for agent B, however, his problem is maximize utility subject to XB PX plus X, oops, YB PY equals zero times PX times 10 uh, plus 10 times PY, all right? Well, how do I solve the maximization problem for agent A? Well, don't, don't try to take any derivative or anything because you know, it's, it's very simple. Uh, this guy doesn't care about good Y, so he should not spend any money on good Y. So therefore, the optimal uh, Y this agent is going to consume is zero, and so he's going to spend his entire money on good X. Well, what is his entire money is 10 times PX. What is the price per good X? It's PX. So therefore, he's going to consume 10 units of good, I, uh, good X. Meaning he's not going to, uh, and he's not willing to make any trade. Okay. Uh, well, but the same thing in the previous example, the agent wasn't willing to uh, sort of uh, uh, trade and move somewhere other than his initial endowment. Because of this, we couldn't find a Walrasian equilibrium price. All right. So that's kind of a key. Uh, dynamic here. Well, what about agent B on the other hand? Well, for agent B, it's simple. Uh, marginal rate of substitution, this is perfectly differentiable uh, concave uh, uh, utility function. So I can use MRS because the solution will always be interior. How do I know that? Again, go back to the utility maximization uh, lecture videos. I already worked on this type of utility functions. All right, so the marginal rate of substitution for agent B must be equal to the negative price ratio. What is uh, his marginal rate of substitution? It's minus marginal utility with respect to good X, which is uh, uh, X to the power of, uh, minus one half, divided by just one, uh, marginal utility with respect to good Y, which is equal to minus PX over PY. The minus terms will cancel out. Uh, so this is basically equivalent to saying um, 1 over 2 squared of x equals px over py, all right? So therefore, x is equal to uh, py squared over 4px squared. This is what x is. Well, what about y? Well, simple here, we don't have any relationship between X and Y. Th that's okay, but we didn't use his budget constraint, right? So let's use his budget constraint. This is XB, by the way. Let me put it now. Uh, XB is this guy. So PY squared divided by uh, 4PX squared times PX, so 4PX, um, plus YB PY must be equal to 10 PY, right? So therefore YB is equal to uh, equal to 
uh, 10 py minus this term py squared divided by 4 px and everything is divided by py uh, which basically means uh, 10 minus py divided by 4 px so this is how much uh, agent B is going to demand for good Y. So market clearance condition, market clearance uh, for good X. And then I will also do the same thing for good Y if I can't reach a contradiction here. Well, good X, uh, agent A is going to demand 10 units of good X and agent B is going to demand uh, this much py squared divided by 4px squared so this is the market demand what is the market supply for good x uh, it's 10 coming from the first individual zero coming from the second in individual so 10 so that means uh, py squared over 4 oops px squared is equal to zero once again uh, i can't have this i cannot have px py positive and satisfy this equality right if they're positive this should be positive number cannot be zero for this to be uh, uh, zero while well, py must be zero right so uh, this condition can hold uh, only if and only if price of good y is zero yes we are looking for positive prices but let's suppose py equals zero is a wall rise in equilibrium uh, can it be well it can't be i mean if you plug this py here you're gonna see the market for good x will clear the market for good y will clear and so it must be wall rise in equilibrium but there's a huge mistake you're making you cannot plug this py into those demand curves why well because remember when i was doing all this calculation right i divided both sides by py for example to get yb and when i did this i assumed that py is zero because you cannot divide some number by zero and say this is you see what i mean so you can do this division you can you can divide both sides by py and the equality doesn't change only if only if py is non-zero positive negative doesn't matter but it must be non-zero okay so that was an assumption so when you say uh if we're looking for an wall rise in equilibrium it must be zero but can it really be zero i mean can, can it really be wall rise in equilibrium it can't be another way of saying uh, seeing this is if the price of good y is zero look at the agent b's i mean agent a yes he doesn't care i mean uh because he doesn't care about good y but agent b he values good y and as he consumes more good y right he is going to willing to buy more and the thing is what is the optimal demand for good y for agent b well it's infinite but the thing is this is demand do we have that much supply infinite supply well hell no we have only 10 units of supply for good y so therefore zero prices again once again can never be wall rise in equilibrium and hence here i'm sorry we say market for good X will clear only if price one of the prices is zero. Hence the conclusion. So we don't really need to look at uh, market clearance for good Y. Hence no Walrasian uh, equilibrium. Okay. That's it.